episode 283 of the Stag Raw. Um, before we get started, I just want to bring your attention to www.loopercycling.com slash aloha. That's because uh, Looper Cycling are helping to fundraise for age group athletes that qualified for Kona, which if you listen to the Simon Cochran episode, that's the women um, this year. Uh, those that qualify for the Worlds in the age group category, Looper Cycling are helping to fundraise to get them to that event so that they can go and compete after the months and months of preparation and uh, equipment required for the Ironman to then go along and perform exceptionally, qualify, um, but not be able to go is quite quite a hard thing. So they're looking at each athlete needing about well, north of 10k New Zealand so of course that's flying to and from getting everything there accommodation transport food the etc so looper cycling uh, doing an awesome grassroots initiative to help support those female athletes so as I said check it out um, for more information about Aloha cycling Jersey visit www.loopercycling.com slash Aloha uh, that'll be much appreciated if that's something you're into if you're a uh, cyclist or triathlete want to support some of these people that are that have done a great job trained well performed well and uh, get them on the plane to Kona right as I said episode 283 this episode is Ryan today um, ex Air Force fitness things learning things business things life things founder at Consult Co Aotearoa uh, and he's also the run leader for Frozen Few Run Club up there in the Bay of Islands. Check out both those links of course in the show notes. Ryan's work there uh, to his individual page at Ryan Today um, will also be there in the show notes. Go and check that out. We have a wicked yarn about his time in the New Zealand military um, doing wonderful things and then now moving forward into post-military career uh, and yeah business training fatherhood massive really awesome conversation here with him make sure you go check him out while you're in the show notes of course the podcast is brought to you by Kane's Dear Velvet www.kane'sdearvelvet.com our body knows how to heal but as we age it can sometimes struggle to keep up and injuries aches and pains come knocking Kane's Dear Velvet is packed full of amazing nutrients that the body uses in maintaining the immune system bones joints circulation and general well-being simply replenish the nutrients healing happens and you are left to get on with living your life to the full find out more at www.kane'sdearvelvet.com and use the code STAGRAW252 for a 20% introductory discount um, when you're out doing hard yakka, some drink element is the ticket. Drinkelement.com slash stagrow for your free sample. Just pay for shipping, or else you can do an order at that website. Um, of course, $100 US gets you free international shipping. Otherwise, you're all good and go there in the US, you lucky buggers. That might even be to Canada. Uh, don't hold me to that. Drinkalipa.com slash collections slash all products. Alipa, the world's smartest brain food, 100% natural, caffeine free, effects you can feel. Again, get 20% off with the code, this time STAGRAW at checkout. Uh, 20% off with the code STAGRAW, drinkalipa.com. Without further ado, let's get into this awesome chat with Ryan today. Episode 283 of the STAGRAW. Make sure you're subscribed and you've left your rating. Cheers. <music> Ryan Ryan this is yeah <laughs> what's going on man yeah great name yeah no I just got the um geez we better touch some wood the daughter to bed but um she's pretty stoked um Nana's coming to pick her up tomorrow so and they're off to sort of staying in a hotel she reckons so oh oh that's very nice yeah it's, yeah yeah um I'm plus and she's keen to go to sleep because then it's tomorrow <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the one that's the one yeah I've got three so uh pop them down in sort of a consecutive order you know from sort of the youngest through to the oldest so just got the last one down so fingers crossed what ages are they mate um so i have a five-year-old he's the oldest then a four-year-old and then like a 20-month-old so 
pretty busy yeah how many months is that like three-ish yeah 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 something like that uh yeah he'd no, be like four um yeah five. Four. yeah yeah <laughs> uh, yeah four or five and like uh, almost two-ish um <clears throat> yeah he's he's uh full-on he's i guess got two older siblings so you know he's he had he never really was a baby he was more like a a, a little person to start with because he just has these people to copy basically mm. Mm. yeah <laughs> and so the five-year-old was it still while you were in the military yeah actually yep so all three of them wow uh, yeah while i was in the military um and yeah it was sort of um the, i guess the reason i i decided to leave in the long run like it's uh it's it's not it's not a tough life as such it's just your way a lot eh? and mm -hmm. so um when when it was just my wife and i she understands because she is in the military still and um you just sort of understand that you're these ships passing in the night what's that oh no thank you just had a delivery of a um queen anne is that what they're called yeah nice the gluten free oh true <laughs> well there you go <laughs> right she's still in the military <laughs> yeah she's still in the military and um so she gets it you know but then when we had kids it became a, a little harder to go away and then each child we had made it harder and harder so for me um the decision was pretty clear to uh it was sort of time to move on uh from that from that lifestyle you know it's it's not really conducive to family i'd say in the long run um and yeah that that was sort of i guess the reason for leaving um but i loved it i enjoyed it for sure so what were your two roles well, what is your wife's role <laughs> yeah uh, so my wife is in logistics still um fortunately she has a role that um is remote in nature so she can uh, do it from where we live in the bay of islands and then um she just has to go to meetings and stuff every now and then uh, around the place but um I was uh, in a security-based role uh, slash training role, um, and I did that for like 14 years. So, um, yeah, it went fast, man. I, I sort of joined in 2007, and I thought, oh, yeah, I'll give this a go. You know, you just sort of finish high school, and um, I had a gap year in between high school and joining the military, um, which was beneficial because, like, quite a few people just joined straight out of school and um they don't really have any life experience as such you know so had you finished of, had you finished year 13. yeah i did year 13. Yeah. um and uh i yeah just joined the military um i was actually meant to join straight after school but in the end uh, i took the option to go abroad and live in australia with my my dad and my stepmom for a bit just to try life um and yeah got a couple jobs over there and almost went to uni there um but it was just going to cost a lot eh? you're an international <laughs> student basically so uh, i just thought it would be you know the same you'd be treated the same but it wasn't the case so um i um yeah sort of re-engaged with the military so I, I joined yeah like i said the air force and um they still had an opening for me so i did a gap year and then i joined in 2007 and uh i didn't think i'd stay that long but yeah it ended up being 14 years so um i joined a like i said security role which was uh really responsible for um it's called ground defense basically taking care of the air base itself and then outside of that concentric rings of security were um the army and then you know your coalition force and whatnot and so we were responsible for the airfield um in a lot of ways and um that was part of our role and then the other part was training people so did a lot of um training um all of our personnel just on the range how to requalify on their weapon every year um some other sort of basic training uh which is called it's like uh you've seen those movies where people wear those uh suits with the mask you know and sort of chemical environments like jarhead styles well mm -hmm. that was sort of what we taught and everyone hated it and they hated you for teaching it because it's <laughs> <laughs> you just got really sweaty you know this the charcoal lined to you know sort of filter those chemicals in, in real life 
and um yeah everyone's just all like black and sooty and really sweaty and just over you um making them put the mask on take the mask off um in a real training environment you use um tear gas what's called cs gas and um on the base that's not what we did because you just couldn't really uh tear gas the base commander <laughs> when he came on course so He'd love um, you. yeah yeah so it was all notional training and because of that notional yeah. fact that everyone thought it was a ball leg so um yeah that, those are the sort of things that i i did and taught in that role and um i guess yeah part of that role as well was security of the aircraft so when our aircraft would go overseas it was our responsibility to um ensure the safety of the aircraft which just meant basically um patrolling around the aircraft or liaising with other militaries on the airfield or if it's a civilian airfield the civilian security and depending on the threat level would determine if you were armed or not but probably uh, 80 90 percent of them were unarmed um you were just armed with your quick whip basically um but then yeah anything sort of middle east area then you were obviously armed up and uh yeah that took me around the world so i was i was pretty lucky pretty lucky and so were you still in when those new helicopters came or were you all, yeah yeah i was in yeah. when all, uh, all of the new stuff either yes yeah, like the new <laughs> helicopters came, or yeah i just got out when when they're getting like new toys finally which is good um <laughs> but yeah yeah the, the, it's um yeah the security i guess um the view on security really changed uh in the air force when the australians brought over a really like brand new plane a really nice one and then uh we had like a basically a cattle fence around our base and um, <laughs> someone climbed over and then they tagged a big cock and balls on it and uh, there was a there was a diplomatic uh, embarrassment for new zealand <laughs> and um that was when everyone started really taking security seriously um and then since then you know events um on the bases have, have progressed where you you know you get um bomb threats where you get people um basically driving onto base you know um then sort of mentally unwell but you know saying they have bombs and the, and, the, and the threat level is really just increasing if not anything so um yeah that sort of happened in my era i guess you could call it um which new, yeah. zone, which new zone bases were you on uh so i was really only in auckland so pretty mm -hmm. fortunate that uh just some of the roles i had to do i bounced around auckland i never really had to go um to army too much um or woodburn like we have a base in blenheim which is really nice um that's where all of our training is i was so glad that i chose the air force over the army because we train in blenheim and they train in wayudu like i've done plenty <laughs> of time in both but i know which one i would rather rather be in <laughs> i don't know middle of winter and blenheim could still get cold man. yeah it, it does get cold it does get cold bro but um yeah and uh yeah like i said it took me around the world some of the best trips i've had were um like the um Pacific Leaders Forum ones around all of the Pacific Islands um, or to China, something like that, China, Korea, et cetera, with uh, the Prime Minister, John Key at the time. It was really cool. Um, and then, yeah, a few trips into Afghanistan and stuff like that. Um, yeah, it was just sort of um, eye-opening for like a gizzy boy, um, you know, and I was only, you know, my early twenties then, so uh, yeah, it was pretty cool. So you said um, you grew up in Gisborne, um, and then you had a stint in Australia. Where in Australia, and what did you have your eyes on at university? Yeah, so uh, I was living in Queensland, so I was living in Brisbane, uh, where my dad lives, and um, I just thought it would be cool to um, study law. Like I'd learned a little bit about it um and had thought about it while i was still at high school and um in auckland and then i moved over to aussie and you know thought i could do the do that there but um yeah like i said just the cost in the end didn't work out and i knew that i could go to uni um through the military i didn't know when i was going to do that 
the uni part, but I knew that it was an option. And so mm -hmm. in the end, um, joined the military and then like over eight years, it took me eight years part time because I was always away, but to get a business degree, but at least I didn't have to pay for it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I just paid in other ways, I suppose you could say. Yeah, the yeah, yeah. service. I've still got about a, a year to go on my 96K of, of student loans. Yeah, yeah. I was listening to one of your podcasts. Man. Yeah, I, I can understand. I got a lot of mates like that. They, they just don't want to even know. About yeah. It. Yeah. No, and, and I'm and I'm probably one of the lucky ones that uh, the pay on the other side worked out. Like I said, I got a year, yeah. a year to go, but crikey, it could have been worse. It could have been worse. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. No, no offense to the arts or whatever, but <laughs> be a <BA>, man. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah. how did you end up at school in Auckland? Uh yes. Yeah, so I was actually, like I said, from Gisborne. So I grew up there uh, to about eight, and then my parents. Um, we're together at the time they they moved us down to Christchurch so I was yeah sort of Canterbury boy I suppose for oh till I was about 14 15 so I really loved that lifestyle down there mm -hmm. uh, it was very very like weird contrast to go from Gisborne like a, a small town just out of Gisborne which is highly um populated by Maori and a lot of your family and then to go to Christchurch um to a country school and then be the only maori there it was like whoa okay oh so 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 you're like wow i've just um completely like changed um i opened my eyes i was like well there's actually other other mm -hmm. people out there you know and then um i spent like i said about eight years or something something like that down there and then my parents moved to auckland just because of my dad's work and um then i went to like a sort of central auckland school and then they had like 30 different nationalities you know so it really was good moving around like that because it just opened my eyes uh to different cultures and different different points of view and then it made being in the military super easy because you just meet so many different people and you know when language is the barrier mm -hmm. um particularly in the military where you're trying to build relationships with people, then um, it can be difficult if you haven't experienced that. But if you know someone that's from there or you know a place uh, within their country, you can really start to build rapport pretty quick, you know? And if you're trying to build hearts and minds, they call it where you're going into a place and people don't necessarily want you there. And um, you're trying to um, do your job, but, also uh get to know people then it's all about building relationships and i found moving those different places really helpful uh, for mm -hmm. what i needed to do in the military and it just exposed me to life in general you know it wasn't so like myopic my view on the world yeah it's so a where did the gap year idea come in uh it was my dad i was actually like fast tracked to um the military i'd already done all of my testing and uh, they did like a big recruiting drive thing at the time, so they'd already. What year was this? Uh, it would have been two thousand and five. Right. Yeah. Um, so yeah, they sort of wooed us by getting us on the base and showing us all the cool stuff. And one of the ways they get yay is, um, particularly with the Air Force, is um, you know, yeah, 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 everyone can be a pilot. Turns out like it's like one percent can be the pilot. <laughs> <laughs> You know, you're all like, yeah, man, I want to be a pilot, you know, and you're like, go to these recruiting things. And you're like, what do you want to be? Pilot. What do you want to be? Oh, I want to be a pilot. And you're like, oh, well, who else is going to do anything else? Turns out the rest of us, you know, <laughs> and out of that, you might get one person. So that's how they capture a lot of the other trades. And it's kind of what happened to me. I didn't have the smarts or the skills really um, to be a pilot. Like, they're so switched on, particularly in the military setting where they spend like a million dollars on you. Mm -hmm. A lot of them are really onto it. And you can see it from like uh, like the 17 year olds. You're like, oh, you knew you wanted to do this like from when you were like five. Mm -hmm. you know? I just thought it would be cool. Um, and so, yeah, it, I guess that's how I um, ended up doing the gap year. My dad asked me and then it just, you know, I, I think my life would have been completely different if I had stayed in Australia for sure. But um, I'm glad that I came home um, and gave it a crack uh, for sure because it um, it was just a great lifestyle. Eh? What jobs did you do? 
Uh, and, and Aussie, you yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I had one where I worked, like I'd never had a job before, not a wow. problem. Yeah. You know, I just, I, I painted for an uncle, you know, the painting company or like did odd jobs, but never like a proper job. So it was good um, because that was one of the one things they said when I was 17, they were like, you haven't had much life experience, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, they they were happy when I said, I'm going to take a gap year. They were like really good because um, I think they just saw in the pipeline, the training pipeline, when people... Uh, joined straight out of school, straight out of home. Uh, they didn't really know how to manage themselves and take care of themselves. And, and no, no perspective, eh? Like no oh, perspective on life, you know. But there, there, you'd there have, you'd have major FOMO, like, oh, all my mates are working, getting paychecks, or, or all of the other mates are at uni, just like pissing up stuff. Yeah, like, exactly. Where are they getting all this money from? I'm, I'm here at the bloody bit of the tree under, yeah. under the thumb. <laughs> exactly, bro. So, um, yeah, it was, uh, it was just sort of, yeah, the opportunity that that came up. And uh, yeah, I guess I joined, and um, yeah, I never really looked back. Eh? But, so what were those um, jobs? <laughs> oh yeah, sorry, the jobs. Uh, yeah, so I worked at a news agency. Um, oh shit, honestly, <laughs> I actually got fired from there. Um, yeah, I I had to hand out like lotto tickets and then like stack the shelves and stuff like this. And but at the same time, I got another job um, at like a big warehouse stationery, if you will selling furniture and i could act, i was actually pretty good at selling stuff so i did that for like a year and i'd never really had too much of my own cash and, and I, you know i was earning pretty good money doing that and doing the other job and then obviously like growing up as well in australia which was pretty good and um yeah that just gave me this the life experience i guess that i didn't really have uh, going over yeah what did, what did you find with with selling what was it commission base or just uh yeah selling? it could be it could be yeah for sure like if you sold these warranties like they always wanted you to sell warranties with stuff eh? if you got the warranty then you did get like some sort of commission i can't remember what it was but it was pretty much nothing but um i think it just i don't know just i guess always being able to talk my way out of stuff it helps that my grandfather was a second-hand car salesman <laughs> and um, and my dad's a real estate agent and uh, stuff like that and so i was always brought up around it i suppose and it just sort of um worked you know i i guess i didn't i didn't really lie or anything like that it's just um i don't mind the chatting with people you know yeah. especially something that uh, i've gotten used to yeah did you get much training in that first year not really man i worked with this <laughs> this really grumpy old german guy yeah he was like <laughs> <laughs> yeah he was um his name was will but uh he taught me a lot taught me a lot about life and one of the major things was i do not want to be here selling furniture when i'm like 60 something you know what i mean he'd been there a long time and he was just over it grumpy everybody didn't like him uh but he seemed to have uh, a soft spot for me you know i probably just was a young kid and just did what I was told and tried to sort of learn what I could from him. But I think at that, at an early age, I realized that, um, you know, we're all flawed in our own ways and that um, just sort of the pick little things from people that I liked and that I'd add to my own skill set or, you know, just um, my own sort of kit bag of stuff. And, I guess that's what I did throughout the military as well, because you come across various leaders, you know, really good ones, okay ones, and then just really not good ones. And I find that I always learn more from the not so good ones, you know, because you're like, yeah, when I get there, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do that. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to do that. That doesn't work, you know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm not saying I didn't make mistakes leadership wise and whatnot. You know, a lot of it's just on the job kind of stuff but um yeah i took that same principle i suppose uh watching people and learning from them and um yeah into into that sort of life but uh, um like i was saying it's it's funny like that was 14 years and it went like that mm -hmm. and now i feel like i left and i'm like okay now when i when i when i grow up i'm gonna be <laughs> you know <laughs> your next yeah. life isn't it? yeah my next life i'm gonna be this you know yeah. and uh that, that, that's what i realized it's just 
when you're in it you think this is all i'm going to be this is all i'm going to do and then you leave and you're like wow there's actually like this huge world out there eh? yeah not many people actually understand what what i did or what we do in there you know yeah Mm. you said that you did a bit of growing up was there anything major or just was that process of like having a routine and and paying bills like great great yeah it was like when my dad's like hey uh you you got a job now and i was like yeah i know i'm like gonna buy some shoes He's like no 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 you gotta pay rent man and you gotta do this and you're gonna do this i was like what what is this i've come you to know? australia to chill me. yeah i moved to aussie man like yeah <laughs> and uh yeah that, that helped me grow up obviously i had to get my way around and um just pay for everything myself so it was a great lesson because up until then yeah i was just a student i suppose in a lot of ways my parents just let me focus on school and it helped you know like i did okay at school um yeah probably like one of the first in my mother's side anyway to actually finish school um so yeah that that's why i never really had a full-time job i suppose just side hustles you know mm -hmm. yeah yeah and, and did you connect with anything while you're in brisbane any sport or anything like that uh, i was playing basketball so i always loved basketball same at high school all throughout mm -hmm. my high school um and yeah that's the one thing i will say for for queensland i don't know about the other states but uh their basketball um just just the way they have all the parks set up there's always a hoop somewhere and it's not tagged usually you know and the hoop's not missing and um there's just always people playing basketball always pick up pick up games and then they've got this great recruiting system into you know the the higher levels that i'm not sure that we do do have here but yeah that basketball certainly helped me when i joined the military because i just went straight into playing basketball and um you know playing sport like yourself it just it just helps you to get to know other people you know as soon as you come to a place you're like i don't really know anyone but i'm going to play sport and that's sort of how you get to know everyone yeah no it's a quick and easy tool and, and one that i do miss having having in my tool belt is like oh, i'll just go play rugby meet yeah meet, meet you know 40 guys straight away <laughs> yeah that's right 40 mates you know um yeah it's 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 it gets harder when you stop playing for sure but i found like having a gym um has been helpful when i left you know because you're always in this team environment either in sport or in the military setting and then when you leave you leave man and they stay and you you go and then you're like, man, I've built all these friendships, but everybody's still in there. And then and I'm out here. So I found, um, yeah, just going to the gym, meeting great people and uh, creating that same type of environment. And then, yeah, like this running run club as well that we've started. Um, just little things like that to build connection and community. How did, that, how did that start, the run, run club? What have you called it? Oh, yeah. So it's called the Frozen Few Run Club. Um, mainly around this concept of running and then doing a cold plunge either in the beach or we've got some ice baths coming and it was just like a cool spin on things rather than just be a run club because mm -hmm. I've been part of athletic run clubs and they're not fun you know you're, <laughs> you're puking at the end and uh, we so so my friend and trainer my coach um, he'd be really good for you to like, yeah I've, you, to be honest so you've got that pin on your on your page right yeah yeah yeah, yeah. great guy great story man i mean he had like um non-hodgkin's lymphoma oh like, wow the yeah. window was like from i think it's like 18 to 30 and he got it at 29 point something and yes. uh yeah the, the percentage of people that survive is really low but um yeah he's a, he's a beast and um great guy and he was like yeah i think we should start a run club eh? like and i thought yeah we should it would be cool um to connect with people because we find that you know now we're always constantly connected but we're not connected connected mm. you know and um that's sort of where the idea came from and it's just growing organically um it's in the bay of islands they, they didn't actually have a run club as such up here like that they have one other run club which is like an athletic running club um and that's about it so it's yeah really just a community thing to get to know people for me for sure because i'm not from up here and um yeah we want to do some cool things around um the mental health space and do some talks and get some some other people you know um you might have had on the podcast a buddy of mine harry sanders uh, he does like phil's marathon and stuff yep. like that yep yeah i think he did 
one of the his, yeah, his things, eh? Making him, wave, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Um, you know, people like that. Um, just to talk about their journey, mental health, and um, we also want to do some other stuff around um, cold water immersion or, cold, you know, cold water therapy and just other cool things that we're interested in. And so that's sort of the run club aspect, I suppose. What's the demographics in Bay of Islands? Like, are, most people, are most people in by here or not really? Or? Oh, yeah, I'd say um, like, oh, well, I live in Kitty Kitty, so mm -hmm. it's probably one of the bigger towns. Mm -hmm. uh, but, yeah, a lot of our runs we just hold in Pai here for now because it's just like so nice. Mm -hmm. um but we do plan to move them around but yeah i'd say predominantly either here pai here or there's another couple towns kawakawa and um Kaikoua, that that would be predominantly where the bay of islands population would be i would mm -hmm. say yeah but it's very um transient i guess with tourism particularly now that it's starting back up i moved just the month before auckland went into lockdown you know that august lockdown till christmas so um <laughs> things are like actually picking up now you know before was um pretty you felt pretty bad for the businesses eh? it was pretty quiet down there and what are, what are most people involved in that do live there work-wise yeah uh, i'd say uh well tourism probably yeah and uh there are like a few factories i suppose you could say like the meat works and things like that but a lot of the people i know that i sort of mix with at the gym like a lot of them work for themselves like i'd say at least 70 percent of the gym that i go to all do something for themselves i think you kind of have to up here you know um it's, it's just not a place where you where there's a lot of main employers i suppose uh so a lot of builders a lot of different tradies or um what else yeah just people with e-commerce businesses or you know other other things like that seem then, to be up here mm. and then agriculture and small horticulture and yeah of course yes sorry yeah, yeah farming and whatnot um for sure is a big one um ar around this region i would say yeah but mm -hmm. um yeah one of the things that shocked me was that it's the most unhealthiest region per capita mm -hmm. um and i kind of see why um fortunately there's no kfc here but the damn four square sells this delicious fried chicken eh? <laughs> <laughs> they're onto it man um but yeah it's, it's one of the most unhealthiest and it's like one of the lowest decile mm. so you can be mistaken uh for me anyway like living in kitty kitty and living in the nice part and then like going to pie here and that that this is what it looks like but you only have to just stretch out a little further and you realize how rough it is you know a lot of gangs and um just yeah a lot of just a lot of uh those ills you get i guess with uh lower income kind mm. of things and uh, people on the red line and um yeah it's definitely uh, very similar to i guess where i came from in gizzy in, in some ways yeah and do you feel the isolation like again back back to gizzy did you notice it much not really uh i never noticed it there i guess you're just surrounded by family and up here in terms of isolation oh, nah not really man like i think there was a time like my wife told me i uh, would have been when gabriel was happening the oh, cyclone um she goes, yeah, we're, we're apparently cut off from Auckland. and i was like oh didn't even notice you know like everyone just sort of carried on doing doing stuff we're like well that's not such a bad thing hopefully you know there's enough food for everyone you know but um i don't i don't particularly know so i actually enjoy uh that part having you know spent uh, m most of my life in auckland it's um quite a good change i suppose yeah mm. and and so going back to being in the air force you said the security role was sort of high responsibility what was that sort of pathway like like you said you turn up and not everyone's the pilot and everybody else yeah. gets the trade well how did, <laughs> how did you yeah, well, find, we, we, find we, your way into security yeah well, i think it's just um i said that i was interested in law and they're like hey there's this trade they also have military police 
part of it you should do this and i was like that sounds amazing and then <laughs> i did it and then i was like wait a minute you got me you know uh, I, sh I probably could have done logistics or something else but um in the end i chose this trade and we were always like the poor cousins eh no one really liked you until you know shit sort of hit the fan and they're like hey we're deploying we really need to learn how to use these things and um yeah also we need to learn how to use that because apparently there's like a chemical threat in the area and you're like oh okay now no, yeah sure we'll teach you you know or like why are you guys on this trip with us you know like <laughs> why are you here we're like we're, 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 we're flying a, you know we're flying to the the islands we don't need you you know and then hello something happens they're like oh we'll talk to the security guys so we were always the poor cousins and it, like over my career um that certainly changed uh, which was good um the the mentality towards us and security that people actually like took it kind of seriously but um yeah I, I probably did that security piece uh for like the first six seven years something like that and then fortunately i was able to uh do an out of trade role it was technically in trade but um work at our survival school um so that that survival school was called the seer training center uh CS stands for its military acronym it stands for survive evade resist escape and yeah i worked there for three years training air crew we trained all sorts um we trained navy divers because they dove in places they weren't meant to be so if they got caught behind enemy lines they needed some you know sort of standard operating procedures and some processes uh and we also taught recon i mean recon because same thing they're in places they're not meant to be so they should know how to do certain things to be you know picked up and yeah that's what i did for a three-year block it was awesome i probably probably would have stayed longer it's just that your trade kind of pulls you back in the end and there was an opportunity for me to go back as a senior there but i left in the end and never never pursued it i suppose you could say but throughout that that three-year experience it was amazing because you really you have to do all the courses first so you don't just get to teach people you have to do all the training yourself and then so you go through the similar emotions and sort of feelings um you know when you're thrown out on a life raft for you know a day or two and it's pretty rough and people get sick and you're freezing and all of that stuff and then from there you go to like a coastal environment where you're staying on a beach still no food uh, hardly any water and you're making a shelter and then from there you go to the bush same thing still very little food to no food and then you go solo for a couple of days two three days and by the end of that you know you've lost 10 plus kilo you know, and you've just lived all of these lives and those little phases and so having done the courses and then taking people for the training you really get to see the real humanity real people you know because it's all good when you're fed and you're watered and you're warm <laughs> but it doesn't take much just take away a few things sleep being one of the main ones you know warmth and people change just like that you know the true the true uh human beings and us come out you know and um yeah it was just something i found interesting the psychology of survival and watching people you know sort of being broken down by the process and then the elements and then building themselves back up learning the skills and then using them and I always found that really uh interesting and rewarding for me it, it, it uh I it, it gave me a resilience I didn't really know I had because yeah obviously you have to do fitness tests and stuff to get in the military and to stay in and you do different things that would be perceived as harder than the norm in civilian life but when you're all doing it with your mates it's just the norm you don't actually know that you're doing anything like hard and yeah that that training certainly gives gave me resilience and other people more resilience and then then you go and do like uh the overseas courses with the americans i mean they're just their their whole systems on steroids you know it's just amazing it's how Sometimes like how, how things should look yeah <laughs> how things should look but uh yeah they they have a course very similar 
It's called SV80. It's the worst kept secret, but they tell people not to talk about it, but you can Google about it. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's crazy. Uh, but the best part of that was the um, the level C um, sort of resistance phase. So the resistance phase refers to you being interrogated, basically, you know, and getting the slip, uh, like sort of like slapped around a little. They call it camp slappy sometimes because they can't punch you but they can slap you and man, can they bitch slap those people? <laughs> they just got it down to a fine art. You don't even know it's coming, gone, you know? And you're like, what was that? You know, and they they sort of take you through all the other bits of training and they were pretty straightforward because I'd already done all of those courses and it was really cool. They do it in um, Washington State, so Seattle, mm -hmm. just out of there place called Spokane and then all the training is done on the border of Canada yeah. so it's a beautiful spot and you're just like that's where Boeing is right Spokane uh yep close there in Seattle but um yeah similar area and um yeah it's very similar to here and so none of that was new uh, the cool part was they put me and the buddy I was with from New Zealand with a whole bunch of like gung-ho young uh, mm -hmm. special forces guys so you know, it, it was an eye-opening experience for me because um, they had just come through the training pipeline for them was oh, must have been two, three years, you know, yeah. to get qualified. And they were various trades like uh, pararescue men. So they're the ones that jump into either the water or the, you know, out of the blue and parachute in and save people, you know, that kind of thing. And then other guys were um tactical air control party and they just call in bombs and they like air traffic controllers for bombs crazy stuff i just, and, I just, I just reading a vietnam book in here the tactical air control was just exactly that like yeah well i think one of those yarns they had they bombed an enemy that was 15 meters away i was like screw that yeah <laughs> that's danger close uh, yeah yeah I'm, I'm sure it's like 250 is like danger close maybe 500 maybe more than that but um yeah, they, they they always mocked these tech P guys because they were just like nuts, pretty much. <laughs> You're calling yeah. it bobs of like yeah, 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 yeah. They were crazy, but they were so switched on, eh? Like they could stack aircraft. They were only like 18, and they're they like, yeah, they basically made us run an airport, and we were just like handling all these uh, one of their main airfields, and they were like, you know, people are yelling at you, and you're trying to like stack these bombers and other things coming in to land, you know, and a lot of people fail that way, but um yeah the power rescue guys were amazing too a lot of them like wanted to be surgeons but they sort of chose to do this first and just the way they knew their entire traditions and history was just unreal they knew everyone that had died in the you know the um the war against terror or mm -hmm. whatever it's called and um they could name them and they would do press ups first thing in the morning and then there's always pull up bars outside of the messes there and like there's just a there's just like a payment that has to be paid when you go in and when you leave, you know, it's like, I don't know. It's like, it's like Jeff, Jeff Bridges, isn't it? Bam. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, you get to mix with people like that. And that part was cool. Uh, the part I wasn't sure about was the, um, I guess, the code of conduct after capture. They call it CAC for short. And, yeah, I just remember coming out of the field and we were all tired and whatnot. I fell asleep on the bus and I shouldn't have because then I woke up and we are in this, like, this fake town basically and then these people come on you know and they're like yelling at you and i was like oh fuck this is real you know and then they put a bag on you and then they like march you around and they just they take away your humanity you know mm. they call you swine and whatnot you're not a human anymore and then yeah you get dragged into this big area and there's just like 30 instructors i'm sure everyone on the base just comes down to watch these new kids get the shit beaten out of them and then they pull the mask off you and then they're just yelling at you like three or four people yelling at you and then you're like it's just sensory overload you know mm -hmm. and you don't know anything at the stage how to how to resist interrogation or what information you that you can give up and so you're just giving up everything you're like oh, i don't know you know and me even having done survival training although i wasn't like qualified in that I should have known better than I did, but you know, I didn't. And it just sort of fell into the moment. And they're like, How did you get here? How did you get here? And I was like, I don't know. Oh, on in New Zealand. And they were boom, smack me. And then they're like, No, how did you get here? And then you have to go into the scenario that they've taught you. And you're like, Oh, yeah, sorry, I was this person doing this thing. And yeah, then they do the various things. You do like a POW camp, 
which is like a tiny cell that you stay in for a couple of days, I think. And, you know, you've got a can of piss in and that. And they just don't let you get any sleep. They play white noise. They play crazy sounds so you can't sleep. What's, and then, what's your white noise? Because I've got one down next door. And it's oh, like, yeah, yeah, me too. It's not, not quite white noise. It's like, a, <laughs> it's like screaming or crying babies or like screaming. Oh, yeah. oh, Basically, yeah. yeah, or like just real the stuff terrible. that you put white noise on to stop <laughs> yeah exactly exactly yeah 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 so not not like the white noise the kids listen to but um yeah just just stuff like that and then anytime you just start dozing off because you could hear your mate next door in his concrete cell um his knee their knees would hit the door because you're falling asleep you know you're like, <laughs> like that and you just hear this because they said you have to stay standing you know and for about Oh, half of it you're like yeah i've got to stay standing otherwise they're gonna like slap me again and i don't really want to be slapped and then you realize hey they don't actually come in that often and then by the end everyone's like stripped off and they're like chilling out in there and that's what they want you to do you know but at the same time they don't let you get any sleep so you just like wake up and then you have to thrust your hands out of the little hole in the door and then present your hands you know and so they just kept doing that so that they knew that you're just about falling asleep and then a do it again you know and so did various bits of training like that and it just made you once again another tool that you can add to your kit made me a little bit more resilient i suppose and then um yeah did other other training like cold weather training and stuff like that up the mountains here in new zealand or in antarctica and stuff like that so um yeah it was a great three years man awesome so, so loose so as a facilitator, did you get much intel on when the skills have been implemented in the field or that sort of uh, remained up? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, there were uh, – it was, wasn't was really – I wouldn't say our system's as good as the Americans for gathering information, but as an example, because they had so many assets and people abroad, particularly in the Middle East, the Middle East was like one of the best places to, to crash in a way because – like Afghanistan being one, you could be picked up within 20 minutes. That's wow. just like what would happen. They're so efficient with it. And any anything they learn from, it's called an IP, an isolated person, can be, uh, that information can be taken and then pumped back through the pipeline within a matter of weeks to then be taught on the newest courses, you know, the one that I did. So it's all pretty relevant information. So um, yeah. They people go, hey, yeah, you taught us this in training to use this type of mirror to get picked up. Didn't work, you know. This is actually what we did. And they're like, good to know. We'll mm -hmm. put it there. Uh, whereas in New Zealand, we haven't really had too many cases that I know of of people isolated for too long, I would say. But yeah, it would be good to have a similar system. Yeah, you'd get all of the Intel reports from overseas anyway mm -hmm. about that. But um, yeah, your main fear was just ending up on. Al Jazeera with them and <laughs> getting your head chopped off with oh, a rough shit. Yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, and that was a real threat, particularly, yeah, for, well, just for anyone really. They didn't care if you're from New Zealand either. You know, there was this myth out there that, oh, they love Kiwis. No, they didn't. No, if you yeah. work with American, you're American, you know. So that was that Five Eyes Intel group? Yeah, Five Eyes. Yeah, group. Five Eyes is really good to be a part of in some ways for us because it gives us access to certain systems and training. But it was weird. Like, I probably did a yeah no on that training and then another like exercise I did in the states. You're like yeah yeah no we're five eyes bro we're five eyes and they're like oh hey hey you guys are just gonna have to leave the room we've just got something it's just for us and you're like but I thought we were like we've we've told you everything we're doing they're like oh yeah no nah. you know sorry bro <laughs> kind of thing um so yeah I think it's five eyes to a point and then it must go to like Aussie. Yeah, you know. Yeah. Well, that's that's what was quite interesting with this book. They were sort of talking about Vietnam that we went there due to a diplomatic status, and then he then he goes into the fact that with the nuclear free stuff, we kind of got bumped out, and then when it came to war on terror, we were kind of trying to earn back our diplomatic right with yeah, our rights. That's, that's exactly the case. That's how I was told when I was in. Was uh, we were you know there was ANZUS which was Aussie, New Zealand, US. And then that just disappeared overnight. And so we didn't have a lot to do with the US in, in my first half of my career until all of the Five Eyes stuff started back up, which was cool. You know, you had this access to this, um, yeah, this, this huge system, which is quite helpful. Yeah, far out. And then mm. so going back to security, it was 
did you yeah did you feel, it was, uh, it was a lot more relaxed? I was ready because it's like jumping on a speeding train you know because you were just constantly teaching courses you know because it was always new people coming through new pilots that you had to train and uh yeah it's just a really small unit so you didn't have the rank structure that i would have had at my other units where you could manage and then make people do the things mm -hmm. you were the doer and the instructor and everything else in between it's just you get tired you know so it was three years was a good good break um and then i was ready to go back and manage people you know so um i didn't mind that at all um but uh yeah i guess in that phase when i went back which would have been my last couple years in 2018 i guess um that's when we uh my wife and i had our first child my son and it was sort of like a wake-up call man because up until that point like i was 29 i think just turning 30 and then I was like, holy, I've got this thing that I have to teach now about life. And, you, you know, just don't, you don't know until you have a child and you're like, this is huge, this responsibility. And I sort of looked at my life up until that point and it was pretty, pretty storied in a way. I was like, I never really had to try hard to do anything. You know, it just sort of happened for me or to me. And, you know, I was luck, lucked out that I got loving parents and wider family and lucked out that, you know, I was okay with the books, so I had enough uh, now to be able to get into the military. And then, you know, I was okay at my job, so then I got the trips and the the courses that I wanted and things like that. And I was like, man, how am I going to teach this child about life and how to deal with setbacks and resilience when I really haven't had many? You know, everything's <laughs> sort of gone my way. And that sort of led me down the path of, I guess, trying to trying to trying to um facilitate that bit so trying to find ways to get these learnings so that i could be better to teach my children about life because i think you know they're gonna deal with setbacks i don't know what that is going to look like or what that's going to be my greatest fear is obviously mental health mm -hmm. things you know in that, in that space and them not being equipped or just not being able to deal with something when it doesn't go your way which is most of the time you know i think so sort of our generation there was just sort of part of it you know we were lucky we grew up without computers for a while <laughs> you know and the, cell phones the bully, the bully stayed yeah. at school and probably was in another classroom and, and yeah you know, and your kiss carried on for those other moments it was just when you crossed in the canteen line or whatever yeah exactly exactly then so so um yeah it, it sort of started that journey and then i knew of this course in the military that was called omania and it's a maori word which just means uh like means to be like resilient plucky uh means a whole bunch of other things tenacious and it was a uh, an army-led course that they opened up to the entire defense force so navy and air force could apply as well but um we didn't always get in you know it was it was an army paid thing at the time and so it was was more favored to army because what they were wanting to do was um one of the previous chiefs of the army wanted to really create a ranger divert a ranger battalion like the u.s army rangers i guess mm -hmm. but they didn't i mean that would cost a lot of money and they didn't really have the resources to to do that so what they did was they took parts of that now i'm not saying it's like the ranger course at all that's like three months of hell from what i've heard from people <laughs> that have done it but it was parts of that parts of the sas selection in some ways now not the same again and designed to really test people and and produce uh more resilient um more like i said tenacious operator at the end whatever that operator did or was and uh that would that was what the program was designed to do and so yeah i ended up putting my hand up to do it and i got on there in 2019 i think and it was the best decision i made probably one of the best courses i've ever done and just best things i've done in my life because um there is no rank same as the u.s ranger course so we were all different ranks you know there were officers down to like sergeants like me or down to privates who just joined you were all the same Mm -hmm. and so the rank wasn't there anymore now different levels of experience you know and then people would leverage off of that and vice versa um which helped having those different experience levels 
Um, but yeah, it was 33 days and it was tough, man. You know, there were, uh, I think there were about four different phases and they were about a week and a half long, dependent on what they were. But uh, same thing as I'd experienced in the survival space, no food really. But in that in that sense, in our survival courses anyway, you're, you're sedentary most of the time. You might be like collecting wood or I don't know, just something really low level. But in, in, in on the Omania course, you're humping, dumping, you're moving like 20, 30 kg packs, boats, jerry cans, you know, you're uh, having like, you know, 20, 30 Ks over mountains and things like that on no food and then no mm. sleep. You know what I mean? And so... No, I uh, don't, thankfully. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, yeah, yeah. Your body starts to eat itself pretty quick, eh? And I thought I lost a lot of weight on survival, but, oh, man, I lost a lot of weight on that course. And, yeah, there's just different phases. The first phase is like a training phase, if you will. You know, they make sure that you can swim because there's a decent amount of water activity in there. And then they do some navigation stuff and some first aid stuff so that you, you know, you can patch yourself up if you, you know, break a femur or something like that and, um, or your mate gets hurt and then, you know, some basic survival skills just in case. And then that first phase is not too bad. You know, they sort of just test you. And the, the tough thing, of, well, the cool thing and the tough thing about that program is that, unlike any other course you do in the military, which is assessed by an assessor, the the staff who are in charge do have final say, but you're actually peer reviewed. So mm -hmm. uh, you've got a group of, I don't know, 10 of you in your element or whatever you want to call it, your group, and you're ranked from one to 10 for that entire phase. And then they move you into another group and then another group, you know, and, and the, the idea is to, um, sort of be around that, that top area, middle mm -hmm. to top, and not really be the ninth or tenth guy consistently because they'll cut you then mm -hmm. basically, or you'll self-select, yeah. you know, and realize it's not for you. And so really there was no uh no way for you to hide after, you know, sort of day 10. You can't just be, you know, you can fake it for a few days, you're this person, but like I said, when you take a few things away, people become who they are. And yeah, I was just really proud of how for the most part, I actually for the whole thing, yeah, that I handled myself, you know, I wasn't too jack. Jack's like a military term uh, where you just uh, think of yourself, you know, you, you throw your mates under the bus too much. Um, I wasn't, yeah, I no, I didn't have any of those moments, I suppose. Um, but, um, yeah, that, that's the cool thing about it. And then the second phase was sort of a combatives phase, which is just, you're just like fighting for a whole week, basically in the mud. Just uh, there's this drill called the world to win, which um, is pretty good the first couple of times, but you know, like 20, 30 times later, you, you're naked and you're just fighting in the mud, trying to get one knife and there's like 10 of you. And the whole intent is to um, yeah build that world to win, you know? So sometimes you win, you get the knife and you, you're the one that survives because you fake stab everyone. And then, <laughs> um, you know, a lot of the time you lose, you know, but they're like, cool. Now think of this in a real setting that, you know, who is going home? Is it you to your family or is it the other person? You know, and when they put those little spins on things, it really makes you reflect and you're like, okay, yeah, now this could be real. Okay. And then it just gives you more, I guess, emphasis to push hard consistently. And so, yeah, you're doing that, learning close quarter battle, combat, uh, whatever you want to call it. Um, and a lot of various like ninja like moves, which are really hard to remember when you've like fed and you're slept. So we were unfed and we hadn't slept that much. So it just looked like terrible dancing. But um <laughs> we we um yeah no couple weather there. Yeah, <laughs> pretty much no, 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 no couple weather there. But, <laughs> but yeah, and then it culminates in this thing called the bastard, which is a huge round robin thing where you're just getting hammered by it. I don't know, 20 people and just going around from station to station trying to do the different like parry, parry kick that you just learned but you can't remember. You know, really the whole thing is you're just trying to stay alive, you know, and the worst thing is they put you around 
And you're like, yes, I'm done. And then they go, again, you know, and then you're like, mm. oh, no. So you just built yourself up for that one sort of circuit and then you got to do it again, you know. And if it wasn't good enough, then you win again. And, um, yeah, it's just stuff like that. And then there's urban phases, which were cool in a way because it was your rest phase where they just dumped you in some derelict building and you just begged for money basically off the street and ate out of rubbish bins and things like that. You know, it was sort of quite eye-opening once again to the um, uh, on the other side. You know how you see people begging for money? Mm -hmm. And you're like, oh, yeah, I'll give some today. You know, some days oh, I don't have anything. Sorry, man. Well, yeah, being on the other side, you're like, well, this actually really sucks. You know, I'm legitimately hungry and um, I'm begging, you know, for food. Um, but, yeah, that, that teaches you. At least, least there's an opportunity there. Like, yeah. When, when you're in the middle of nowhere, there's no opportunity. Exactly, exactly, yeah. So that's why we always like the urban phases. They would give you a certain amount of time to go out and scrounge legally, you know, you're not, like, breaking and entering, uh, although I think it did happen on some of those programs because you're just so hungry, you know. But, um, yeah, and then you're doing sort of uh, raids, if you will, where you're doing mission profiles and, then you're, um, you know, doing sort of hostage rescue type stuff. And that's just hard because you haven't slept or eaten, you know. What, what was the mindset through all this, like especially early on where, where there is yeah. no, no option? Like what, yeah. and what, what do you now call on? Uh, yeah, uh, for me, it was just, I knew if I could make it through that experience, I would get a lot of learnings out of that, that I could apply to my life and to my parenting and just little anecdotal stories that I can teach my kids in like, you know, 10 years when they're struggling with something. But so you, uh, so you now have a, a plethora of no fucking excuses. Pretty much. And the, the hard yeah. thing, you know, like when you wait this program they it's called a program because they don't call it a course because the course has to have a set curriculum whereas a program they can just tweak you know and like if things don't you know so they just get to move the pieces around so when you do finish it you get this the tab that you know it's like a uh it's this it's pretty much just say the manga, the manga on it and um you can wear that on your uniform you know and it was like an identifier for people around it gave you a some some people gave you respect you know other people were like you know if you're on an army camp they're like oh look at this poser you know kind of <laughs> thing but uh it, it was mainly cool for promoting the course you know and telling people hey man you should do this thing it's free where else are you going to get 33 days off from your actual job you're still paid and you get put through all of this training system um but yeah the hard thing at the end they go cool you passed now the challenge for the rest of your life is to live up to that Mm. and be that which is hard and i do not do like all the time but um yeah you're right you, you sort of get this um system and and like mm. throughout that i was just thinking don't quit mm -hmm. it was like you can die but then i didn't quit you know so that was my mentality pretty much wow. and um my wife was okay not with the dying part but she goes yeah don't quit if you quit, don't come home. Kind of, just kind of like, she didn't mean it like that, but she was like, you've trained really hard for this and we're letting you go because I had, oh, my son would have been one and I just, we just had our daughter. She would have been like eight weeks old mm -hmm. and I left uh, for 33 days, no comms, you know, no communication of any sort. So she said, if you're going to make us do this, then make sure you do it properly, mm -hmm. you know? And so, um yeah, that was sort of it. I just knew that I wouldn't quit. And I guess people say it all the time, but that definitely changed my life for sure. Um, so like that, those times where they'd like knock you down or change change the plan or make you do it again, did that just ring in your ears, don't quit? Yeah, it did pretty much, man. Like, Because um, you can see when someone's going to quit. Eh? Like you could tell the ones that were going to quit because they start talk. You can see it in their eyes and then they start talking about it a little bit. They're like, oh. So what did oh, you yeah. do with it? What did you do with it? Block them out or what? Uh, yeah, because it's hard. Like it, it's contagious, eh? Particularly mm. in a really hard um, evolution, like training evolution. Like the water stuff was really hard. Like as it's cold and you're just sprinting up and down the beach to keep warm, and then they're back in the surf, and carrying boats and bearing boats, and it's just like a lot of people quit, you know, in those in those spaces, and you can really see it. And for you, it's like. For me, anyway, like I 
would try to convince people not to quit um, because it's just like momentary, you know. Um, but at the same time, for me, it was like a little win because I was like, damn, I really thought that person was going to like make it all the way. And then they binned it, you know. And um, for me, it was just like a little like cool man, keep keep charging type thing, you know. Um, but, yeah, we had people get injured and whatnot. So they obviously mm. didn't quit. They were just uh, removed because they were injured. But um, yeah, just taught me so much about life, eh? about people, about myself. And yeah, that I was way capable, like of more than anything I had thought, you know, because for, for a while, you know, you know, friends of yours in the military, they're like, yeah, I'm going to give this essay selection to go, you know, and then, you know, five years down the track, they're still, yeah, I'm going to give it a go. And then they don't. And then you've got others that just disappear. And they go do it and then you never hear from them again you know and then you just assume they're in there and um for me i was never sure i had the ability to show up to something like that yeah. and then once i completed that i was like geez i could if i wanted i was way too late in life i was 30 so it's I'm not saying that's too old there are older guys that go into that round but you know like as an example it was probably on that course i knew that i wanted to get out eventually soon and you know we we do this final big mission after doing this big uh, 60 plus k pack march by yourself you know no food no sleep you go they just go it's called the green mile and you just they just go just keep walking till we tell you to stop mm. and then you do that you rest off for like the night and you think yes i'm done and then they go no no there's one more one more raid there's one more mission you know and the whole time they're getting you to um do sort of observation posts on different public buildings and things. And um, we happen to do ours in Wanganui. And um, yeah, we were always watching this race course and we're like, why are we watching this race course? There's like nothing on here. And then all of a sudden they go, yep, plan a mission with these assets and for this target, you know, deliver it to us. And um, yep, we'll let you know if it's a go. Sure enough, you hear the helicopters coming to town, and you're like, oh, this is actually going to happen. <laughs> then you get up and you get raced to the helicopter, and you're like, well, this is actually happening. And then you just fly in, you know, into this target, and it's like lights are on, and all the boys are, like, loving it. And, like, half of the guys that are on that are wanting to do that permanently, you know, in, like, a special forces capacity. And we had people from Canada and yeah, just New Zealand and, and and a lot of those guys are now, you know? And so for them, that was like, yes, this is what I want to do. And for me, I did it and it was awesome. Had fun, you know, like doing this hostage rescue type scenarios and choppers and stuff. And then we flew away from that target after like doing a good job. And I was like, I don't want to do this. <laughs> you know, all I could think about were my kids. I was yeah. like, I just want to be there, but I'm here. You know, and I'm looking at the guy across from me. He's like, yeah, man, this is awesome. And I was like, this is not awesome for me. And that's how I knew, you know, that that I was out, that it was time for me to go and that I didn't want any more of that lifestyle because at the end, the instructors who were all ECS, like the, the main ones were, and they're like, yeah, you know, that 70K walk you just did, that's our walk to work. Then we got to do the job. And you're like, man, that sucks. You know? <laughs> yeah. And they're like, they're like, you know, like, Oh, yeah. So, you know, once you got your comms, your uh, ammo for enough week, your water, and then this, what do you think the last the last thing, to, oh, the, the first thing to go is food? And they're like, oh, man, what? And they're like, yeah, we lose a lot of weight when we do this. And, you know, like we had a packet of um, jet planes and we just suck on the jet plane for like a whole day. I was like, what? <laughs> You're telling us now? It ain't cool, man. So, you know, it takes a particular person to want to do something like that. And I just wasn't that. But it taught me a lot just about how much you can actually do and how much we all leave on the table, I suppose you could say. Mm. And just in general with anything. You know, you think, oh, I'm tapped out here. I've, I've, I've used all my reserves. I can't actually push anymore. But the reality is, like, we can actually push a lot more than we can. It's just maybe we don't or something holds us back or it's mainly your mind i suppose eh yeah and just you know don't worry if your piss looks like coca-cola just carry on <laughs> <laughs> yeah 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 mine definitely did not but it's yeah, so <laughs> anilin goggins through part of that man <laughs> yeah it was, it was funny um you talk about you say so i ran into willie apiata for the second time in my life 
Oh, uh, right. last yeah. last Friday, just oh, yeah. Holy fuck, there's Willie again. And the, yeah, the, first, yeah, yeah. The, first, the first time was real classic as well. I was in the supermarket in Pukekohe. They might have been like straight after the yeah. first the first lot of lockdowns, and it was just like the strangest thing. Like he was walking towards me down the aisle, and I was walking down there, but I just kind of gave him the. I was like, "Sup, bro?" And he's like, "Sup, bro?" And I was like, <laughs> "What the fuck just happened?" The <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, he's a legend. Yeah, 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 legend, yeah, 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 yeah. Living legend. Um, yeah, yeah. Now that's pretty cool, man. I can't say. I've... Oh, maybe I've seen him at stuff, but I haven't ever. I'd love to have a yarn to him one day. Yeah, 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 man. I'm actually, I I'm actually run into you twice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Do you remember me? <laughs> <laughs> no, you probably met so many people. Have you yeah. seen about the like sucking on the jig blades and stuff and losing a lot of weight? Yeah. What was the refeed process like? Yeah, so they yeah. do like once you're finished, <laughs> the <laughs> medics all come in and they're like, okay, guys, so your, your stomachs have like insanely shrunk. We'll just take it easy like we'll take you out to town just you have your wallets back now you can just you know just, just buy a couple of things everyone's like straight to meccas <laughs> straight <laughs> like you're just like in like you know your 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 body's eating itself mm. so you're just eating everything and obviously you can't keep it down so no. people are just like shitting themselves spewing and then you're just like continue to eat and it wasn't the most healthiest way to put on weight but yeah i think i put a lot on in the first week you know and then i you know, my wife had to give me like the word, "Hey, you're not on that course anymore, so you need to stop eating like that." You know, <laughs> I watched I watched uh, Elliot House the other week. For some reason, he came up on my YouTube for first time in a long time. Oh, yeah. he, he'd done 20 days fasting, and yeah, he had the his. I think he always has gigantic bowls, but this gigantic oh, bowl yeah. of, of broth, which he then put egg yolks in, and then he started. He started eating this weird concoction of like broccoli and and um, cauliflower rice, <laughs> but he, but once he started that, he just started just like oh oh, oh yeah. like going yeah. out. It just didn't yeah. stop, and I was like, oh, this is getting weird. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, like some sort of weird food porn or something. Eh? Yeah, I, I I did not think about broccoli or salad after that. You're just like sugar because you all got these lists in your mind. Like eventually, like I've never been that hungry where you're like can't stop thinking about food you're just all thinking about it and you're trying to focus on some complex task and you're like i'm thinking about food again stop thinking about it and then you think about food or someone's talking about it you know and we all had these weird little lists of like stuff we wanted to eat eh? yeah. and um yeah just sort of kept you going you know you're like yeah when i leave i'm gonna eat this you know and then you realize that it doesn't taste that good um but in your mind you built it up but mm -hmm. um yeah, yeah, I guess, you know, so so that, that experience did teach me a lot. And then because I was, like, wanting to continue to engage with that, I just fell into, like, running because they always make you do it in the military, and I just hated running, I suppose. But I wasn't half bad, but I wasn't that great. And then I just thought, well, you get free running shoes, you know, in the military, I'll just start running. And then I, you know, was just doing like halves, then full marathons. And I was like, oh, I'm just going to do ultras. And then, yeah, just sort of slowly got into the ultra game. Uh, yeah, just did like a 50K to start to wet the whistle. You did a 50A. Yeah. Yeah. Which was, one did you do? Aotearoa. So uh, 2,600 meters of elevation. It's oh wow yeah yeah yeah. pretty, oh, pretty hurty <laughs> yeah it, it's terrible yeah yeah that's really tough yeah i had a mate that actually did that one yeah he did he do the 101 or did he do the 54? i'm not sure from memory but um he was always brilliant on elevation eh? so yeah just was his thing you know like he was great on the flat too but like he could just climb elevation um, elevation is what i want to get good at because yeah, I I, I, want, I want to take that into the hills, and yeah, after yeah. that, when I went into the hills, I was like, oh, this is great. Yeah, but yeah, but, yeah like I said, when you try and do it all at once, it gets pretty bloody sore. <laughs> yeah, it would do, it would do. Yeah, there's just some mountain goats out there, eh? But yeah, I can see how that would be super helpful uh, in a hunting aspect, you know, like because then you you're not just like sweating your ass off and like looking at the ground; you're actually like looking around, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because um, that's the thing, like all of the stuff we were doing on that course you're like in reality you would be somewhere you're not meant to be so you're having to be alert as well as carry all of this load that's just the next level of like 
focus mm. as well as like to be that fit you know what i mean but um yeah i fell into the ultra stuff and did a 50k with my dad which was cool he came over from aussie he was sort of old school endurance athlete rugby player and yeah i just remember growing up in christchurch with him and he would run these massive sort of 20k blocks around mm. where we lived out in the country and i'd bike you know and i'm like <laughs> i'm going home this is terrible you know i was like why are you doing this you know but i didn't know what he was teaching me you know then he was doing like coast to coast and things like that i just didn't know at the time i was like why are you doing this this is i don't even understand this i just want to go skate but then you know that was sort of what i saw and then it just fell in it just so i guess it just sort of left an imprint on me and then yeah to do my first ultra with my dad was cool he just sort of had cancer the year before and then he was in remission you know and it was like a year to the date of his um final like chemo that he mm -hmm. that we did this run it was it was pretty epic man i didn't i didn't know how he would go because he wasn't able to train too much for it but he just powered through eh? and so that's something i always remember eh? was um an experience like that and then, did you run together or nah uh, we tried to start because he's a really good runner um but it was pretty clear early on he goes nah i don't got the legs man he's like just go for it and he just cramped up it was the total winner um, yeah. for me. so basically oh we wouldn't have even been 10 12k in and he was like my legs are cramped so he just power walked the whole time and like i mean power walked and he he crushed it like i finished and then i ran back to get him and he wasn't that far behind me to be yeah. honest and um the cool thing when you have a pace like that is that you don't need to rest off at the aid station you can just grab and go you know yeah. so that's what he was doing he was just grabbing everything that had salt in it you know electrolytes things yeah. like that and it and I, I guess he just had that old school knowledge that i didn't at the time because i was still new to running long distance and then yeah i that same year i was like oh 50 is all good and then i did the topo 100k um and i think i yeah i was pretty crook for that i think <laughs> i was like i think i had COVID to be honest yeah. um but i wasn't sure but i dragged my family to topo i trained for like three, you know couple months three months maybe and i had met a mate was meeting up with a mate there who i'd done a lot of running with and um he was one of my mates from that um course that i did as well so he was a oh, brilliant yeah. runner just and he was training for the like you say selection at the time and so i couldn't not show up and i was used to like keeping pace with him and it was pretty clear early on and that i was like i'm missing a gear bro i couldn't breathe you know i was like profusely sweating like um <laughs> i think i was having like uh what do you call fevers. it like, yeah fevers during the run <laughs> like it was really bad and i was just popping uh cold drinks cold drool yeah like going out of fashion man i was You're just on the amphetamines pretty much man <laughs> so yeah I, I, I powered through you know i got it done in 16 i wanted under i wanted 14 and under but it just didn't work i was by the end feeling pretty average and then yeah as soon as i got over the line man like my body went into full like shock mode like post ultra and i was just like shaking couldn't stop and um yeah then i had a week off work so yeah, <laughs> yeah. With, with some sort of flu but yeah at the time they're like because covid was just like new they're like if you have any symptoms and i like you have to go to the check in eh, the night before and you have to hand in your gear and i was like okay just pretend don't cough just like keep it straight man and um yeah it all worked out in the end i don't I don't know if it was covid or such it was just one of those crazy daycare bugs that you get from your kids you know yeah like i think, I think coming on early like the week you know a couple of days before like, please don't please don't then straight on race day felt yeah. like a freight train had hit me you know yeah, i think my mate house was on that one 100. oh yeah 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 she was, that was that was kind of how i got doing mine she was like oh, i'm doing the topo and whatever oh, yeah. that was and i was like all right and then i'll tell i came up on my facebook and i was like oh, i'll do that yeah, 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 yeah. That, that's about the right window. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, I guess I just, I did that. And then my wife picked me up from the finish, mm. which um, was all good. And then she could see it was no good, like no good. And she goes, hey, did you get what you wanted from that? Because she knew I was searching for something, you know, this thing, this myth mythical thing that you get from doing a hard thing. And I was like, nah. And the whole time there was a guy that I'd sort of been, you know running past and worth and whatever you know and he goes yeah i'm, I'm gonna do the 100 miler and um to the winner and you know and in, in, in a few months 
And I was like, ah, oh, yeah, that sounds good. And then the, ne- the next morning I woke up after like feeling terrible and we have to go home back to Auckland. And she goes, yeah, so did you get which one? I was like, no. Nah. And I go, I just signed up for the 100 miler. <laughs> <laughs> and she was like, ah, oh, great. So we still got to do this thing, do we? You know, and um, yeah, ended up doing that. Uh, it was like five months later or whatever that was. But yeah, that was a, that was a big one. Yeah, big experience, I suppose. Mm. Yeah, my my dad when I just got over the finish line was like, "Do you think you'd do that again?" And I was like, "Yeah, I don't know, not so sure." Yeah, so, yeah. And then, like you say, by like <clears throat> two days out later, you're like, "Well, maybe if I do a couple of trail twenty sixes, then I'll you know, then I'll do a couple of trail marathons, and then I'll get yeah. back back to like a moderate ultra, and then I'll come back and do that one hundred. Yeah, you're, yeah you're, already, exactly. you're already like pathing out like seven seven races. And I yeah, still, you I still have, man. I still haven't done one since, like, we, we went into 26K run the, the other month. Nice. But, but um, yeah, no, I've just kept it kept it to, like, Mount Tohara and, and I did Royce Peak when I was in Wanaka. And I was oh, like, nice, yeah. Yeah, it's like a few short, shorter runs. And, yeah. And, and then it's like, you know, when I sort my life out, actually, <laughs> you know, <laughs> then I'll be like, right, I can train and, and have a race to go and do. But, yeah. Yeah. And then, I, I would agree. Yeah, I think that the human the human brain has has a very short memory for pain. Sometimes that that's like you know, like oh, we've had three kids, and like you see your wife or whatever go through, and you're like, surely they don't want another one. Sure, <laughs> and then they do. Yeah, and they do. You know, it's the same thing. Like with me, um, I guess with running, you know, I was just I wasn't finished, and then obviously, uh, twenty twenty one was a bit rough for races, so there was just none, and I haven't. I'd been training for one recently, but and that just went. That just finished last week, I think. It was the um, the Riverhead relapse. Yep, yep. Yeah. So I was just going to go and do the twenty four hour event, but they didn't have that option. So then I was going to like actually compete and see if I could run, you know, further than a hundred miles. But I just caught an injury during training, and then so badly for my wife anyway i didn't have to do that because <laughs> yeah it, it, the whole family's involved in those ones you know they what, have to live what's, with you. what's a lap uh a lap was like i think it was 6.7 or something like that yeah hey you know something like that so it would have been quite a few laps um and like and how long have you, have you got for a lap an hour oh that is yeah tight. so so yeah you think about it and i i, I would have had to have a strategy with a crew and stuff because you can't just like if you come in sort of on the minute before the next lap, you might miss your window to grab stuff from your area. Yeah. You know, so you kind of need a support crew, but I just didn't have any for any of the runs that I did. I just sort of sort of was like self aided, I suppose you could say. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I didn't really have a good strategy for that going in anyway. Um, and part of me was like a little bit, like can you actually do this and i was like yeah i don't know that's actually quite hard it's pretty um, pretty muddy and undulated eh? yeah it is by the end yeah because i paced for that one before it's you're just like crawling up you know and so um yeah in the end i didn't didn't end up doing that one but it is something that i want to do because it's a different type of event you know it's like a to b you know you want to make it there in the end because you want to finish but there no one cares if you don't finish you know and like it's all really just up to you yeah and you can start and will not start it's just um it's just a really trippy way to race i think and it's a little more interesting to me uh so yeah that that was why i was going to do it but it, it didn't work out yeah southern cochran doing 200k at like like um blue lake that's yeah that's that, just... that, that, that's unreal way eh? <laughs> yeah it, it, like it's you're not right in the head man it, it, yeah it, it, yeah, it, it, yeah. It, yeah. Big case yeah. from the other day. I'm just like, oh god. Like, <laughs> us in the circle of savages talking about, you know, potentially doing an Iron Man length swim, and then some. You know, a few of the boys. It's not their specialty, which you know, uh, my specialty was not burpees, but um, yeah. <laughs> um, and so I, I just chucked that into the group. Like, yeah. meanwhile, Simon's done ten k swim just then, just been in the pool, and it only took him two hours. You know, <laughs> I think a couple of people were like, oh, we're all at our own, we're doing our own race here. I was like, yeah, yeah, we are. 
but yeah. <laughs> it is it is possible <laughs> there, yeah. there are people there are people doing it <laughs> yeah i know eh? there's some beasts out there and that's the thing there's always levels to everything eh? you know you think you're, you're like pretty good at stuff and then you just only have to investigate the next level up and you're like oh no <laughs> it's really humbling eh? <laughs> yeah well that, that was the same going out on the bus you know people were talking about i think i think um Tarawera must have been pretty soon and you know the 54k was just a bunch of their training runs for the milo and yeah, you, you hear them on. talking you're like i don't want to hear you talking <laughs> no, no, that's right yeah 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. this yeah. is my this is my a race man. This, is yeah. my, this is my thing yeah this is my, yeah. This is my only race yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly but i've never done anything in <laughs> people to do to do one you know like whatever that whatever your ultra is you know like fuck, it's just a 5k or whatever like just it's just good to know what's there eh? you know yeah. what you're capable of man because just you never know you know when it's over it's over and you just you know you're like oh man i should have done this i should have done that not that you know about it but you know you, you just don't want to have that thought of, oh man i should have tried that thing you know yeah. so yeah that's what yeah. This, this circle of savages has been about like we've tried to chuck some tears in there to just try and encourage people to like find their like exactly find your ultra mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. like, yeah. find what that is yeah yeah and like like we see for some of the guys it is like well can i do a 1200 meters swim you know <sighs> yeah, but, yeah yeah but you know and but then like me as a swimmer i think i had my 1500 meters by age six <laughs> yeah yeah i bet man yeah, yeah. and it's yeah. like oh or maybe seven yeah but yeah it, it's like oh that's interesting you know just the the perspective on on, on things it but, is, it but is, then yeah. but then for me now and not having been a swimmer for ages the 3.8k is like quite interesting and mm. then i also am contemplating not that i have a wetsuit to do the 3.8 in lake topol <laughs> and and the element of that is that i fucking hate looking at the bottom of the lake it gives me the shits and, really, I haven't, I haven't seen it. Hey, eh? what's it like? It's just oh, like, it's just like, like full of lake weed. Simon uh, reckon he didn't see it, but I was like, this fuck, it's lake yeah. weed everywhere. Yeah, and like it's like I, I think out where they have the the course, it's a little deeper, so it's a little further away. But oh, in, inside of of the like no no boat boys, it's like right there in your face. And I didn't oh. realize I didn't realize that it was like right there in your face because they had me yeah. wearing goggles. And it's like, oh, oh shit. this this has made it even worse. But uh, yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So that, that's how I'm probably going to try and make it a little bit harder is, is do it open right. water, but then I'm going to need somebody to do it. But my mate, yeah. Matt, my mate, Matt, who's done some triathlons and things, he's keen to come and do it with me. So we'll yeah. see how we go. I need to find myself a wetsuit, I think. Yeah, yeah, a good one. Yeah, yeah. like um, wetsuit helps you float, doesn't it, a little yeah. bit more. But yeah, I reckon, you know, some of those people that do that long distance swimming, like I had one the other day of, like an old Joe Rogan podcast with Peter Tia. Oh yeah, like, some lady like she had a crazy rate, like stroke rate. Eh? It was just like she was a phenom type thing. Well, even know? Peter Tia is like swam around all the islands in Hawaii. Yeah, all the islands in Hawaii, and like from that shark infested one, Catalina <laughs> and stuff like yeah. that. Eh? Was like, mate, you're no slouch either. But um, yeah, that that that's quite a cool cool skill to have, I reckon. Um, did, did the running help you exit? was was that something you started doing while you were still in yeah i was doing it while i was still in but it definitely helped um engage with that you know sort of that brain um if you will that just wanting to push a little and uh, i think it's something that will always be part of my life eh? some sort of um running type activity but i like i do want to get into um you know triathlon it's just obviously cost and mm. Time mainly, <laughs> time, you know, is uh, is the big thing um, and the support that I would need from my family for that. So, you know, I, I think that is in my future, that type of thing, but just, just not yet. But, um, yeah, for sure, running. I, at the moment now, like, uh, we're doing this um, turf games thing uh, at my gym, which is uh, the competitor to, I guess, CrossFit in some ways, um, but it, it, it's not so – olympic lifting focused mm -hmm. and uh there's a big competition in, on the gold coast so like our gym and and our small groups were sort of training for that so that'll be a cool goal because i sort of had two goals this year physical ones which was you know do the um riverhead relapse which didn't happen and then cross train to this um 
I guess, sort of more lifting focused, um, high intensity cardio type uh, training. And so I guess that's what I'm doing. I'm still able to do a lot of that, even though I have got like an injured foot. Um, and so that's been quite helpful to have something because I think your I always need something like that to just sort of keep me going. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, just, I do. <laughs> yeah, it keeps you focused on on a thing because I find that if I don't have something to focus on in the distance, then I sort of get kind of like wayward, you know. Yeah. And then you start questioning stuff, and you go, "Oh man," you know, like then that whole um, sort of self doubt can creep in and all of that. But um, it just gives me like a north star i guess to, to focus on so yeah it'll be cool i have no idea what to expect uh, from this but um yeah it's been good lifting more and running less because lifting and running is really hard to be good at because they're both counterintuitive i guess you know yeah, yeah. definitely lifting can make you more resilient and you know your, your your body more resilient to the pressure that you place on your body from running but hard to get good at lifting and hard to get good at running the people that do are just like the real ones you know mm, mm. yeah mm. yeah so like you said when you leave um the air force you've left they stay mm. was there any off ramp or it was like notice period and and good luck with what you're doing <laughs> pretty much yeah you know they're like hey thanks for everything man and you think you know in your mind sometimes when you're like pissed off with your work and you're like man i'm gonna leave this place and they're gonna all know that i was there and like they're gonna be like where is he how did he do that but uh, no one rings you it's just like <laughs> you, 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 you were there, and then you're not, you know, and then you're like, yeah, you're totally replaceable. That's why you get a service number, I guess. Yeah. You know, you have an ID number, but um, yeah, it was like that, so to speak. Um, but I was ready for it, you know. I do know people who, who um, leave and then like they sort of flounder around a bit, and then they get back in because I think they, they find it difficult that teething period you know and there is one like uh, i guess i've been at 18 months now and it does take a while to find your feet you know because i always had this great um you know one of my great uh bosses or in instructors he said when you leave one day whenever that is remember everybody out there is normal you're the weird one not the other way around and i always <laughs> remember that you know like and he's he's right he's totally yeah. right you know yeah so um people just use normal time they don't use 24 hour time you know little things like that yeah but um it's like yeah, such, uh, a, such a simple thing that's like yeah, yeah. don't even think it'll and like you say all your acronyms yeah yeah all your acronyms you know you're like acronym testing and you're like people just like i don't know what you're saying man yeah <laughs> just speaking in binary code or something like that well that, that was this book hey you he, he like introduced it and then just went with the acronym from there. I was like, in my head while reading the book, whenever I read the acronym for the first little while, I just like say it out in the complete thing. So, so yeah, I have so you, con context for the acronym. <laughs> totally, totally. Yeah, but there's this, yeah, in the military, there's an acronym finder. So, because uh, everyone needs one, because you're like, what the heck did they just say? Everything was shorthand. I have no idea what I needed to do. Yeah. So you go online and you're like, okay, okay, sweet. Okay, that's what I need to do. So, it even happens in the military, but, um, <laughs> yeah i think that that's exactly right like you leave they stay they wish you well but i was set up you know to to succeed out here with everything that i did in there so i had no doubt that i was doing the right thing for my family and for myself mm -hmm. you know and so i always wanted to get out and do my own thing uh like have a business or businesses that i could control my own time because really you know for 14 years i didn't control anything you know i was told what to do when to do it and so having some freedom about that now is, is really cool and hard at the same time because you're the only one holding yourself accountable i suppose yeah so what, what was sort of the process to get into a minimum effective product and yeah so start shipping what, what you're yeah, good at <laughs> yeah 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 so that's the thing i had to like narrow down and find out what i was good at i suppose but you know i got this business degree so i always knew that i wanted to be in a business i just didn't quite know what and then in the end i um uh just sort of fell into doing um digital marketing for people and brands you know because i realized it's like the equivalent of mowing lawns for like businesses you know medium to small businesses they're like I'm trying to like 
keep the business going and then i have to do this posting thing and i like have to write stuff and i have to talk to people like i can't do it you know and then so i just sort of fell into doing that when i left and i guess that's what i've been doing ever since is just really getting into uh i guess social media marketing for people brands and creating their content for them which i actually find really fun and creative you know um and helping sell their products you know it's sales again i guess and what i like about business is learning about other businesses you know so as opposed to starting a business of my own in the sense that i'm doing a widget and i'm trying to market and sell this thing i get to like learn about a whole bunch of other businesses which i find really interesting because um i think it's great to be able to market things and sell things and it's cool to see other people's businesses what works what doesn't work and you sort of get to experiment in a way with marketing uh their product or their service whatever it is and it's just once again like adding those tools to your your kit bag you know because i think one of the great skills now that i'm really trying to cultivate and i think really is probably going to be key for most people is content creation like what you do mm. you know um i think that there'll there'll just be you know a few different types of things people do but one of the things that that i think the military doesn't make you good at is being able to sell yourself and uh, to communicate digitally in the sense of having social media because they're really like social media phobic they're mm. getting better now because they know that they need it for recruiting but you know i was in that time where they're like don't post anything on facebook about this trip you know because you have people take a selfie somewhere and then it's like geotagged i'm at this base that i'm not meant to be at kind of thing <laughs> everyone was always getting in trouble so i was like yeah don't want to do that and then i entered a world of survival seer training where you know it was always like oh man any information you get out there and if you get captured you know the enemy will use it against you you know they'll do a show of force or sh show of information where they're like hey do you live that blah 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 and you're like yeah it's totally googleable i guess but um so that that didn't set me up the best and then i realized when i was transitioning out you need like a social profile um because really for 14 years i just didn't exist i suppose you could say and now i've gotten into this um social media marketing i really see myself like stepping into the world of trying to create my own content and you know and um i would really love to just be paid to be me yeah. <laughs> that makes yeah. sense you know yeah. like kind of like what you're what you're doing man what you you know um and just stick at it stick at it through the really tough times you know like i'm um, geez man i've seen how many podcasts you've done you know like not many people make it that far you know nah. and, I, and i look at rogan and the likes and you know he's on like what's he on like Two or Rup three thousand or rumored that the, the deal was two or three hundred million and oh, yeah. that and that was just to get him there <laughs> yeah i can understand that and you know rightly so in a way he's like a main source of information but just the fact that i guess he he struck at the right time him and tim ferris and that they were they were early adopters you know but i i still think there's a lot of runway left for yeah. for, for people to enter that space you just have to be <clears> good at it and i think the main thing is like you know you're you're very inspirational in that sense that you're like what are you up to like 300 and something now oh uh, uh, in total so this yeah. will be this will be 283. see what yeah. i mean like yeah. that's all rep say you know yeah. like and i think if you can just stick at a thing long enough and i think that doing all that stuff that we talked about has made me realize that consistency matters and just just keep at it how did, how, did crush it, how did crush it come up did you have that book already or it just kind of came up or ah uh, jeepers um because you, you said that it came out 2008 yeah it came out 2008 <laughs> man yeah i must have heard it on a podcast like maybe too yeah. fair actually yeah like way back in the day with um gary v and i was like oh let's crush it you know that's pretty interesting but it's the thinnest book but it's yeah. still so relevant like the dude called everything that's happening now you know and um and he, he was totally right he's totally right and so yeah the, i think that's, that's the thing cool. about gary v as well like even now you can still listen to him and know that he's so ahead of it like his obviously his his agency is going to drive the trends anyway yeah. but 
I saw a clip of him again the other day, and he was going like, all you people at this conference are really going to hate me because you need to get home and you need to make a piece of content for TikTok. You need to make a reel. You need to make a Facebook post. You need to make a LinkedIn post. You need to make a YouTube short. You need to make a YouTube blog. Um, and they all need to be different, similar but different forms of content. Yeah. And you need to have um, something on your website. You need to have your website. Um, you need to have an Instagram post as well. Yeah. That's the real. And, it's like, and you need to be doing that every day. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, it's, just, it's just like, yeah, like you said, you guys at this conference are going to hate me. It's like, that is the answer. Yeah. And and he probably said something quite similar to that. In he did in the book, man. He said, like, you think, you think what you're signing up for is, like, this awesome, like, journey. It's not. It's tough. You know, you're going to have to, like, work at it. And you're just going to have to keep going and be consistent. It's going to suck. You know, you're going to have to say goodbye to sleep sometimes. You're going to have to, um, you know, do some tough things. But I think that's how you get that that breakthrough, that frequency, you know, and that, that's how you reach people is just through consistency of, of effort. And, um, yeah, just overwhelming, like, force i suppose you can say in some ways eh? um yeah i i i think he can put a lot of people off gary just with his like his his approach but if you like it makes him uncomfortable because he's he's actually yeah. fucking doing it he's, yeah he's doing what he says he is yeah but um i i found like one of the ones that made me warm up to him the most was the um how i built this like uh podcast where they interview him and you're like wow this guy actually has a lot of depth and uh yeah just watch what he's doing now i guess because he's gonna be right in 10 years yeah, you know yeah. when he's talking about this and that and everyone will be like damn i should have listened then so um yeah i guess a lot of those books helped me make the decision to leave you know yeah. uh read everything from you know tim ferris and that and it was just like eye-opening i knew that i wanted to do something out here um and yeah i think do, you have to create content do businesses realize like that social media is actually digital marketing no i don't think so and and, and, like, and as part of their marketing spend it's an expense that's that's yeah. an investment like yeah, I, yeah. I, I don't think people get that i don't think oh, people get that about po the podcast landscape as well i've yeah. been trying to have the conversation with people that you know there's an array of content there's your name on it there's this i don't even think people when i say that there's 13 bank clicks backlinks per episode that that's worth something my yeah. my, my friend in, who, who's in real estate said i pay 250 bucks for a backlink yeah <laughs> yeah exactly man like yeah it's, it's all marketing and that, that's what i have to convince people that i work with all their businesses like you're marketing now like if you have a facebook or an instagram you're marketing your own yourself you know and yeah. um and, and you're, I, you're creating it, creating an ecosystem, eh? And like, are, yeah. like, like I said, with the bank link, it's like I've got a website that I'm paying the subscription for. I've built, you know, that probably, if it's any worth anything, that's probably you've paid a massive outlay for it to be built. You're up, updating it. Mm -hmm. um, he's getting somebody to write blogs for it, so it's constantly updating. They're sharing into LinkedIn, which is bringing them back into the website. Yeah. Um, and then like the way that Google works, like you said, it's Google Googleable. Is that a word? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it creates the ecosystem that – so even today I wrote a um, wrote an email out and I um, tagged in the Sam Harris and Lex Freeman podcast. So nice. people might go, like, why would you do that? This Lex Freeman and Sam Harris podcast is – these two people are some of the biggest names in podcasting. Why would you do that? But it just so happens that maybe somebody Googles Lex Freeman, whatever, yeah. Sam, or and just Sam up. Harris, and my thing comes up. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, people, yeah. Don't, people don't realize that. No, yeah. they, they don't. And that, that's what I particularly like about um, podcast uh, medium is that um, it's just like – this is just a constant back catalog, you know. Like I was saying, I was listening to that first one from Peter Atia, like it's like twenty eighteen or nineteen or whatever. Mm -hmm. And same as yours, you know, you you you've got this like evergreen content that will always be there that people can click on. So, you know, you might think I've done an episode, and um, you know, you, nothing happened from that for years, and then someone watched that, someone of importance and value and boom you know that's an opportunity so so like you say it's an ecosystem just putting yourself out there consistently 
mm-hmm. you know, being like omnipresent almost um, in a way just gives you more opportunity to be seen, I suppose. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. and and so like we're talking about with shipping the product, how's, have those conversations been eye-opening for them and then the fact that this is marketing? This is part of your yeah, marketing. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I think uh, I've, I've had to teach people how to do it. Like, you know, I was like, you have to engage. And they're like, well, how do I do that? I was like, well, how do you do that on the street? You're like, mm-hmm. how do you do that with people? It's the exact same way, you know, just talk to them. Just be normal. Talk to them, you know. Don't just like solicit your product straight away because that's just weird. You know, no one wants that. But build a relationship with people. And then, you know, they might find out that you do this thing or you have this thing that can solve their problem. and um, it's really been like an educational thing, I suppose, for people, like particularly in like small businesses that I deal with, medium, you know, and they're going to medium is that they've done some sort of social media marketing or media thing themselves. Uh, but it's always like the last thought of or the last piece of effort before they like nod off at night. It's never um, given the, um, I, guess given the respect it deserves you know and actually have a strategy and a plan because you you wouldn't go into a business without a business plan but you find a lot of people go into a business without a social media strategy and a plan you know and you're like that's just crazy you should you, they should both be the same you know but people just don't view it as that yet but then yeah there's a lot of good companies out there that really have mastered that that bit, you know um, yeah. that are doing very well yeah no it's some um, pretty exciting stuff of, of dabbled in a a number of ways of being into an agency with one of the companies that I worked for. I helped them instigate their Instagram and yeah, going in and and seeing some of the tool backing tools and like you say, scheduling and planning. Yeah. Scheduling, man. Yeah. Scheduling is the one, eh? Like if you, is then it always looks like you're on there. You're like, how, how are there three posts on this person throughout the day? Yeah. Well, that's how, you know, and it's like pre-recorded and all of that. Yeah. You must find that challenging. Um, obviously doing this and then trying to create content for this and then your own stuff as well. You know, it's like time consuming, eh? Yeah. When you have a job as well. <laughs> yeah. Well, I won't go there. What happened with the uh, social media at my last job, but <laughs> 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 we'll, we'll, yeah. we'll leave that for, uh, <laughs> yeah. for somewhere Another else. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I, Hey, I really appreciate what you do, man. Um, just, it just, uh, it, it really is an example of, um, tenacity and stickability to continue doing what you're doing you know you you, you, you might be new zealand's rogan bro <laughs> he's hoping one day i think um, <laughs> yeah. think old, yeah. um uh, dom harvey he's getting mentioned on on hoskins i tried to tag hoskins the other week oh, yeah 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 <laughs> and, well, and, i've already had relationships with, with with some of these people so it helps if you already have a profile prior yeah. you know like all of us like un, un profile unfamous people you know you got to do it i guess yeah. the, the hard way yeah. So, um, but yeah, I, I really rate Dom's podcast too. I've had a few chats with him. Love yeah. the guy. Love the guy. Yeah. yeah. yeah he, is, he is pretty, like you were saying about the, um, you know, back to back to social media as a tool, be relatable, be accessible. DMs. Yeah. Dom, Dom yeah. Harvey DMs. Yeah. You probably get bombarded now. <laughs> yeah. 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 But um, yeah, it's cool. It's cool, man. And he loves to run, eh? So that always helps. But um, yeah. 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 No, keep it up. Really appreciate it, man. Sweet. So where are, where are people finding these three platforms at the moment? Yeah, no worries. So I'm on, it's just at Ryan today on either uh, Instagram, um, Facebook or TikTok. And then I have a LinkedIn, but that's mainly like a business one. You know, everyone has a LinkedIn. These days. Are your vlogs on YouTube? Uh, my vlogs, oh, they were, but I just got real slack with loading them up to YouTube. So I'm actually going to do... Uh, more vlogging or like like decent like length vlogs uh pretty soon so yep. um i'm just waiting for some equipment to show yep. up you know what that's like you have to invest day mm-hmm. um yeah so uh yeah but i'm definitely looking to create more content in that space pretty soon but uh, yeah you can find me on there and uh all the associated links but um yeah thank you for the quarter door man it was awesome just to share a little bit hopefully somebody gets something out of that no, it was it was bloody interesting, and there's probably more we could chat about. What what's something that keeps you in flow, Ryan? That um, you live your life by quote or, or yeah, uh, for sure. Um, I actually heard a real good uh quote the other day. It would happen to be from Gary V again, and um, Tim Ferriss says he's, he made that coffee table book. It was uh, Tools of Titans, and like yeah. I literally had it for since I moved here, eighteen months. 
to prop up my computer and I never read it. And then one day I was like, oh, I should probably read this. And I read it the other day. And there was this really cool saying from um, Gary V. Tim asked me, he was like, oh, what would you say to like a 25 year old, 22, 25 yeah. year old about something? And it was, um, it was just do everything with less angst because there is time. You know, and I was like, yeah, I'm, I think about myself in that way a lot. You know, we're like, I've got to do this. I've got to do this. You know, it needs to happen now, now, now. And to some extent it does. But just do it with all a little less, like, angst and just chill out a little bit more, you know, because you do have this thing called time, hopefully. And um, you will get there if you just keep doing what you're doing, you know. Beautiful man. Mm. We'll be uh, tagging Tim Ferriss and Gary V in that uh, little, little yeah, wheel. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> I have yeah. been regraded by Tim Ferriss before, and holy, sh holy shit! Oh, <laughs> like, epic! I was yeah. like, what? <laughs> yeah, that's that, 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 that's amazing, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so fingers, fingers crossed we get. Uh, crossed, again. Yeah, <laughs> good. All right, brother. Thanks for the awesome, thanks. man.